I'm on nights once again. To fend off the fatigue, I thought I'd set myself a challenge. One of my main objectives with the If It Ducks Like a Quack series is to help people try to think critically about medical claims that they hear in the press or read online. You know the stuff. Blueberries give you a strong heart, turmeric cures arthritis, and caffeine both cures and causes cancer, the so-called Schrodinger's carcinogen. There are many, many ways that medical research can be misinterpreted and people can be misled. Uh, I will deal with as many of those as I can on this channel, but for this video I just want to concentrate on bias. So the challenge I've set myself for this video is to name as many types of bias as I can as I go about my work tonight. But what actually is bias? Well, bias is a uh, systematic error in medical research that leads to an inaccurate result. This could be something like a problem with the de design of a study, or it could be incorrect interpretation of the results. Bias is essentially ubiquitous, meaning it's impossible to avoid completely, but this doesn't mean that we need to chuck out all medical research because the best research papers and studies take great pains to minimize the amount of bias, but bad studies don't even bother. The problem is these data get published, and before you know it, they've been reprinted in the Daily Mail or Mercola or some other uh, website that peddles nonsense, and millions of people have been given misleading, or just completely incorrect medical information. So let's go. I'll kick off with a big one, confirmation bias. And the reason I'm starting with this is because I think it's one of the main reasons we live in this car crash of a nightmare world we currently find ourselves inhabiting, because it's the reason that people like flat earthers, anti-vaxxers, and climate change denialists all exist. Confirmation bias is when you look for information or data that supports your existing hypothesis and you reject uh, data uh, that disagree with you. For example, uh, forget those three groups, they're nutters, but politics. People are more inclined to believe news articles that agree with their viewpoint and ignore or be more critical of ones that disagree with them. This is relevant to medical research because it affects how trials are commissioned, how they're designed, how they're funded, and how they're interpreted. Number two is selection bias. This is where the population being studied are not representative of the population to which the findings are being applied. For example, let's say I want to study the popularity of deep fried Mars bars in the UK. And I get the phone book and I just open it randomly at a page in the middle and call the first 100 people that I find. For viewers that are under the age of 30, a phone book was a large paper solid state storage device where everybody's WhatsApp numbers were recorded. I look at my findings and I find that 80% of people in the UK like deep fried Mars bars. But what I didn't realize is that when I opened the phone book, I opened it to muck and every person I called was Scottish. So I have committed a classic selection bias error in that my study population are not representative of the wider UK population. A um, slightly less silly example would be, say I'm running a study looking at asthmatics, and I want to test whether standing on your head for half an hour every morning is beneficial to symptoms of asthma. And so I recruit 100 patients but the trial lasts for three months, and pretty soon the patients who have more severe symptoms of asthma, the older patients, the patients with very busy jobs, full-time mums, are all dropping out of the study because they just can't allocate half an hour every morning to stand on their head, or they just are finding it hard to keep up from the exertion point of view. So what I'm left with at the end of the study is a group of young, mild asthmatics and my results are no longer applicable to the wider population of asthmatics. A final example might be something like YouTube comments or a customer feedback form in a shop. The people who have a very positive or very negative experience are more likely to leave feedback. So someone who loves my videos or someone who hates them might leave a comment, but the majority of people who probably watch them and go, eh, it was okay, don't feel motivated to actually take the time to do that. Say I'm running a trial looking at the effect of taking a bath in minestrone soup on the success of Tinder dates. And I'm measuring this by using a paper questionnaire. 10 people might respond to me saying that I've changed their lives, they're in love, and they can't thank me enough. Four people might reply saying their success at Tinder dates has actually gone down because they're 
dates complain they smell of cabbage, and four people might reply saying it had no effect. If I was a bad researcher, I might report this saying that minestrone causes marriage. But in reality, there were 72 other people that took part in the study and they found that minestrone had no effect on their Tinder date success. So they lost interest in the study. They weren't engaged and couldn't be bothered to reply to this weird English doctor and his soup fetish. It's almost impossible to avoid selection bias in medical trials because the very patients that sign up for medical trials are probably not reflective of the general population anyway. This is particularly true for elderly patients. We do trials for the elderly that mostly consist of 65 to 70 year olds but are these findings applicable to 90 year olds? And a lot of the patients that come through the door are that age. Another example that's got a lot of media coverage recently, uh, rightly so, is that about three quarters of medical trial participants through the years have been male, but yet the findings are applied to everyone. But we don't know if a lot of these big drugs that are prescribed to millions of people actually have the same effects in women. Number three is confounding. Confounding is failure to take into account something that's not being directly tested, but that affects the outcome and makes it more likely. It's related to study design, so it's of key importance in observational studies. Observational studies are ones where the uh, researchers are just watching and just looking at what happens to a study population instead of actually performing an intervention, a treatment on them. And a key thing to remember and take away from this is you cannot infer causation from an observational study you can just see a correlation. The most famous example of confounding and study design is from the 1970s and it concerns hormone replacement therapy for postmenopausal women. A large observational study looked at uh, women after the menopause who took hormone replacement therapy and those that didn't. And they found that women who took HRT had lower rates of heart disease, which sounded great. And as a result, national guidelines in many countries, uh, starting in the USA, um, recommended that postmenopausal women should take hormone replacement therapy. It wasn't until some years later that a randomized controlled trial took place, which found that not only did HRT not help with heart disease, it actually increased the rate of heart disease, and worse still, it increased the rate of breast cancer. So what on earth happened? The observational study uh, didn't take into account confounders. The confounders were that women who were taking HRT were more likely to be affluent, more likely to be healthy than those that didn't. And as a result, they had many reasons for having lower rates of heart disease, which weren't considered and the link was erroneously made with HRT. When the two study populations, HRT and no HRT, were matched evenly in terms of their demographics in the, in the randomized controlled trial, it was clear that HRT actually had a harmful effect. How many women were actually harmed by this failure to account for confounders? A more lighthearted and modern example would be the kind of products you get from places like Goop. If I claim that a daily Mongolian mango and Sudanese saffron enema from Goop, it's not a real product, I just made it up, reduces obesity, I could back it up with uh, research by showing that I've taken 100 women who have this daily enema and they are thinner than the average rate of obesity in the American population, which just as a guess would be something like 50%. And let's say only 18 out of these 100 women are obese. Wow, that must show that the goop enema is a cause of low obesity. But of course, you've figured out the answer by now. It's that women who buy goop products tend to be similar to the owner of goop in that they are health conscious, healthy, um, affluent, active, and of relevance to this uh, particular study, slim. So they are more likely to be slim anyway, and it's nothing to do with sticking expensive things where the sun don't shine. All of this can be avoided by joining my cult and chanting a daily mantra every morning when you wake up. Correlation is not causation. Correlation is not causation. Correlation is not causation. Now just take this jade egg and insert it into your Number four is recall bias. If a study starts by saying we asked a thousand people how often they ate mackerel, exercised, vaped, or had sex in the last 12 months, 
just chuck it in the trash. I don't even remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. Recall bias is affected by someone's beliefs about whatever's being tested. For example, if someone is a great believer in a particular diet that they've been doing for the last year, they might say, oh, I haven't been sick the whole year, because actually they've erroneously forgotten about the two colds and coughs and sniffles that they had just like any other year. Actually, you know what, I don't think I had breakfast yesterday. Number five, uh, the next one that comes to mind is blind spot bias. This is a uh, favorite, it's where people who are trained in a given field think they're less prone to errors of bias. This is a common problem for other doctors, but of course, it doesn't affect me. I've kind of lost track of where we are now, maybe number five, uh, but this one would be publication bias, which is a really big problem, and it's one that can't really be dealt with at an individual level. Publication bias is the tendency for medical publications to run positive trials rather than negative ones. What's a positive trial? A positive trial is one that shows that whatever it is being tested has had an effect. And I guess it's kind of understandable in a way. Nobody wants to read a study saying that we looked at the effects of standing on one foot and found that it had no effect on impotence because it's not very interesting. It's the same reason that people don't turn on Fox News to hear, today in America, nothing happened. Boring, we want action. The thing is, that's not how medical research should work. It completely skews the data if all we see are the positive trials and we don't hear about all the ones where no effects were seen. If all this talk of stats is tickling you in the probabilities, you will love Brilliant's collection of courses and quizzes about statistics, probability, games of chance, logic, and loads more. It's free to sign up. If everyone understood these concepts, there'd be absolutely no need for this YouTube channel to exist. So if you want to support me, please go and sign up for free. But if you hate me and you want to end this YouTube channel, please go and sign up for free. That's logic. The next one, I think maybe we're at number seven, is uh, detection and performance bias. They're, they're kind of related and a similar thing. Uh, this is where patients who are in the intervention arm of a trial, so remember you can have the intervention arm testing, whatever it is you're testing, and then the placebo or the control arm who get a dummy treatment, and they're the ones who you're supposed to compare the two groups and see if there's a real effect. This is where patients in the intervention arm are treated differently to those in the placebo arm. Either they are scrutinized more closely, that's detection bias, or they actually get preferential better care, which is performance bias. Now, you can solve this by blinding uh, the clinicians. This is called double blinding, where the patient and the clinician don't know which arm of the study uh, the patient is in. However, this isn't always possible. For example, if you're testing some major operation, or if a patient is in the intensive care unit and the clinicians need to know everything that's going on with them. However, you'd be amazed how many trials are published in the press which don't even have single blinding leave aside double blinding when they easily could. Related to this is observer bias, which can also be used to refer to doctors treating a patient differently depending on whether they think the intervention is useful, but it's uh, also a problem that uh, can affect soft endpoints. A hard endpoint is something like number of heart attacks, uh, number of admissions to hospital, or death. I mean pretty much the hardest endpoint there is. But a soft endpoint would be something like, how happy are you feeling? Now, happiness may be exactly what you want to measure, but it's uh, more subjective, so it's susceptible to interviewer bias, which is a type of observer bias, where the person gathering the data might inadvertently ask a leading question or affect the response of the uh, study participant. The next one, um, I've completely lost track of what number it is at this point. It's past six o'clock, but it would be regression to the mean, which is a type of bias. And this is one I wish more people understood. And to demonstrate it, I'll use a ridiculous example of an insane superstition held by many medical professionals, people who should know better, the belief that saying the Q word, quiet, on a shift will make it busier and I have lost count of the amount of nurses who genuinely get mad with me when I say it and they blame me for the shift getting busier. And I always do say it. Let's imagine an emergency department sees 50 patients per hour uh, on average. Now, obviously some hours will be busier than others. So let's say in one hour you might get 75 patients through the door, but another hour you might get 25 through the door. Now, during that 25 hour, if I come along and say, ooh, 
isn't it quiet here today? Regression to the mean dictates that the next hour is likely to be closer to that 50 uh, mark, the average, because 25 and 75 are unusual outliers. So somebody foolish might infer that me saying quiet in some way affected the subsequent hour. But of course, we know that it's just random chance. The same thing happens in medical trials. You'll get random variations. And if you give an intervention just before one of these variations occurs, you might think that this was caused by the treatment. The next one would be diagnostic review bias, which is one I only really understood and learned about when I was running a study uh, looking at a new type of MRI uh, sequence, a new way of imaging patients' hearts. And we were comparing this new sequence with an accepted gold standard uh, sequence that already existed. However, that gold standard treatment wasn't completely binary, yes or no. Like most things in medicine, there was a gray area, in this case, quite literally, a degree of subjectivity. And when you're comparing two different techniques against each other, if one strongly says positive and the other one is ambiguous, you might be swayed to mark that positive as well. Uh, or vice versa. And the way to minimize this, and what we did in my research paper, was that we analyzed all the sequences individually so that we couldn't see which ones were linked and in a random order um, to try and minimize this source of bias. Well, it's now the next day or next night, I should say, um, as you can probably tell from my additional scruff. After that last clip was filmed, a lot of patients uh, were very keen on having pulmonary emboli, so I got rather busy. I did try to explain to them, look, I'm trying to shoot a YouTube video here, but to no avail. So I wasn't able to finish shooting everything in a single shift as I'd hoped. I've also realized I can make a follow-up video to this, concentrating on medical decision-making bias. This video was looking at sources of bias that creep into medical research, but we as clinicians, when we're making decisions about a patient's care, are also susceptible to many sources of bias. So that's a whole new world of bias coming soon to a YouTube near you. Perhaps I'll call it something like 10 reasons your doctor is wrong. I'm sure that won't ruffle any feathers. I'll leave you with a famous statistics joke that summarizes some of the faulty thinking that we've addressed in this video. Uh, and it's the assertion that birthdays are good for health because statistics show that patients who have more birthdays also live longer. Test yourself. Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Which of the following scenarios is more probable? A, she's a bank teller, or B, she's a bank teller and a feminist. <laughs> I mean, total social justice warrior. Am I right? It must be B. That's not correct. The preamble there was to elicit your bias. While it might sound likely that Linda would be a feminist, the probability of her being a bank teller is higher than the probability of her being a bank teller and a feminist. This is from Brilliant's Probability series, which explores some of the things we've talked about today. For hundreds more questions on maths and science, visit brilliant.org slash medlife and sign up for free. The first 200 people to visit that link will also get 20% off the premium annual rate if they choose to upgrade. If you find these videos useful, instead of giving me money that I'll just spend on cheese, all I ask is that you check out the sponsors, and that way both you and I get something out of it. So remember, next time you read something medical in the news, turn a critical eye on it and try to spot any bias. If in doubt, make yourself a nice cup of coffee that definitely will or will not prevent cancer.